या व्याख्यान मालिक पहिल्या वर्षी प्रसिद्ध विचारवंत आणि समीक्षक श्रीयुत सदानंद मेनन यांनी व्हिज्युअलायझिंग आयडेंटिटी द कल्चरल पॉलिटिक्स ऑफ द्रॅव्हिडियन नॅशनॅलिझम या विषयाचं पहिलं पुष्प गुंपलं होतं दुसऱ्या वर्षी आंतरराष्ट्रीय ख्यातीचे चित्रकार वक्ते श्रीयुत गुलाम मोहम्मद शेख यांनी स्टोरी ऑफ द टंग अँड द टेक्स्ट द नॅरेटिव्ह ट्रॅडिशन्स ऑफ इंडियन आर्ट या विषयाचं दुसरं पुष्प गुंफलं होतं तिसऱ्या वर्षी भारतातील एक महत्वाचे सामाजिक शास्त्रज्ञ आणि समाजाभिमुख विचारवंत प्राध्यापक शिव विश्वनाथन यांनी कमू कम्स टू इंडिया व्हायलन्स कल्चर अँड स्टोरी टेलिंग या विषयाचं तिसरं पुष्प गुंफलं होतं आज या व्याख्यान मालेतलं चौथं व्याख्यान इथं होणार आहे आणि हे चौथं पुष्प गुंफणार आहेत भारतातील एक महत्वाचे कवी समीक्षक द्वैभाषिक संपादक आणि विचारवंत प्राध्यापक के सच्चिदानंदन त्यांच्या व्याख्यानाचा विषय आहे पोएट्री मॉडर्निटी अँड रेझिस्टन्स कविता आधुनिकता आणि प्रतिकार हे भाषण इंग्रजी भाषेतून होणार आहे आणि आजच्या या व्याख्यानाच्या अध्यक्षस्थानी आहे सुप्रसिद्ध संपादक आणि विचारवंत श्रीयुत कुमार केतकर मी मकरन साठे यांना विनंती करतो की त्यांनी आजच्या प्रमुख वक्ते आणि अध्यक्षांना मंचावर आमंत्रित करावं राज फाउंडेशनच्या संचालिका श्रीमती परिमल चौधरी यांना मी विनंती करतो की त्यांनी आजच्या मान्यवरांचं पुष्पगुच्छ देऊन स्वागत करा विनंती करतो की त्यांनी आजचे प्रमुख वक्ते आणि अध्यक्ष यांची ओळख करून द्यावी आणि या व्याख्यानामालेविषयी ती सुरुवात करण्याबाबतची आपली भूमिका थोडक्यात मांडावी प्लीज इव्हिनिंग एव्हरीबडी नाव मोस्ट ऑफ यू नो ऍक्च्युली अबाउट दिस सिरीज बट स्टील फॉर दोज हु डोंट नो अबाउट इट professor ram papad was an extraordinary intellectual as most of them as known he expired in 2012 in july my association with him for was uh, about 30 years uh, though i was not a direct student of his uh, i get i uh, gained so much from him and so did and gajanan and so did many other writers actors political activists uh, social scientists political scientists he cut across the society really uh, he was a, he was an extraordinary inter, uh, intellectual not only because he was uh, very uh, uh, good at critical analysis but also because of two other things one that he was a uh, public intellectual not living on an island he was very closely connected with so many sections of the society and also because he was very good at not only analysis but synthesis he could synthesize from many different fields of intellectual pursuit and life uh, we talk about divisions in the society we normally mean economic divisions social divisions there will be religious caste and all those kinds of divisions they are very important no doubt but there is also a division which is developing very uh, harshly and badly and that is a division between uh, intellectuals on one hand artists or creative writers on the other social and political activists on the third and the common man on the fourth and papat all his life tried to breach this gap a single handedly very few of us at least none of us none of two of us have the capacity to do that on our own the only way we could hope to do it was called people like the sachidan and me to uh, do this well, for us it was to repay the debt that we had to 
put to Bapat. This is as Rajanand said, I want to be happy to this is the fourth year and uh, we are lucky to have an equally eminent uh, um, uh, poet and thinker, Professor K. S. Chidanandan. I knew him as a poet for long. I have known him as a poet for long. I met him also some few years back, I think, to take a few years back, first time at uh, Jaipur Literary Festival. I've been very lucky, extremely lucky now, for last nearly two and a half months to have him as a neighbor at Indian Institute of Advanced Studies, Kimla. And that is in that that neighborhood is in a very different sense in neighbor, not not in a neighbor in a metropolitan city like Pune where you don't know who your neighbor is. But uh, there we are tied from morning to evening in a small community. We eat together, we attend the same seminars, we travel in the same car, and we share a maid. So uh, that's a uh, we we have had very. Uh, I I was very lucky over this period to wine and dine with him. I could hear him whether the aside his poetry over a glass of wine and those were one of the most enchanting moments of my life. I will never uh, forgive them, uh, forget them. <laughs> <laughs> he will have to forgive me because, because he had to read my novel in return. But uh, to, uh, to come back to his introduction, his shorter introduction also runs in many pages. I will try to be as brief as possible. I am sure his lecture itself will be his best introduction. Okay. Professor Chidanandan is a Malayalam poet, I would say in India, even international poet, essayist, translator and a bilingual critic and editor. He has a doctorate in post-structuralist poetics and was professor of English in Christ College, University of Calicut, Kerala. The editor of Indian Literature, the Journal of Sahitya Academy, and later the Chief Executive of the Academy. After retiring from the Academy, he worked as a language policy consultant for the Government of India and has been associated as the editor with Tatha Delhi and the Foundation of Sark Writers and Literature. He retired in 2011 as Director and Professor, School of Translation Studies and Training, Indira Gandhi National Open University. He is on academic governing bodies of Jawaharlal Nehru University, Ambedkar University, Anandala University, Kerala. He is now a National Fellow at the Indian Institute of Advanced Studies, Shimla. Sachidanandan has 22 collections of poetry, 16 collections of world poetry and translation, 4 plays, 3 books of travel and 23 collections of critical essays and interviews, all in Malayalam, besides 4 collections of original essays in English. He has edited several anthologies of poetry and prose in Malayalam, English and Hindi. He has over 30 collections of his poems in translations in 18 the languages like English, Hindi, Irish, Arabic, Chinese, German, French and Italian besides all the other major Indian languages. He has won 32 major national awards and honours for, for his literary contribution including uh, National Sahitya Academy Award. He has many international awards also. He has also received many prestigious fellowships, a film on him, Summer Rain was released in 2007. Sachidanandan has represented India in several international literary events. I was told that he has read his poems in 32 different countries. He has been honoured with Knighthood of the Order of Merit by Government of Italy, with Danta Medical by Danta Institute, uh, Danta Medal by Danta Institute, Ravenna and the India-Poland Friendship Medal by the Government of Poland. He has also been an activist for secularism, environment and human rights. He is not only a writer, he actively participates in the social and the political movements very strongly. Lastly, he was nominated to the biggest of them all, the Nobel Award in 2011. Well, I can go on and on, but I think I'll stop here. I'm sure that you are eager to listen to him rather than about him. I will take just two minutes more to tell you about what he himself has written about his poetry. <laughs> he writes and I quote, My mother taught me to talk to cats and crows and trees. From my pious father I learned to communicate with gods and spirits. My insane grandmother taught me to create a parallel world in order to escape the wild orderliness of the tiringly humdrum everyday world. The dead taught me to be one with the soil. The wind taught me to move and shake without ever being seen, and the rain trained my voice in a thousand modulations. With such teachers, perhaps it was impossible for me not to be a poet of sorts." Unquote. 
And what sort of a poet is he? Again, I quote him. Poetry as I conceive it is no mere combinational game. It rises up from the ocean of the unsayable to name the nameless and to give a voice to the voiceless. I would say justice, freedom, love, nature, language and death are natural concerns of my poetry. My commitment is largely to ethical, to values like justice, equality, freedom, love and respect for all forms of life. These have become all the more significant in a world governed by, governed by values of the market and increasingly and violently being colonized by the forces of globalization." Unquote. He subjected at today's poetry, modernity and resistance. We are extremely lucky to have the eminent editor and thinker Mr. Kumar Kethir in the chair. We had requested him to come even last year, but he was out of India at that time. Mr. Kethir needs no introduction to the Pune and Marathi audiences. He set a, set a high benchmark in it, in editorship in Marathi journalism, that over the last few years, any editor after him has to struggle hard to rise up to those standards. He was initially working for English media, as, as we all know, and we are used to seeing him on national TV for the last few years. We are all aware of his work in stature through his writings in Marathi as well as English. Thank you all for coming to this lecture. I'm sure you will have a wonderful treat. Thanks a lot. Thank you. या व्याख्यान मालेजी कल्पना सुसले पसुन ती संपूर्ण पढ़े कार्यान्वित करने से ठी आयोजन नियोजन प्रक्रिया में जानी जानी मदद के लिए आशा प्राच फाउंडेशन अणि तथा संचालिका श्रीमती परिमल सौधरी साधना साप्ताहिक पाक्षिक परिवर्तन सवार्ट सुरु मासिक आंदोलन शाश्वत विकास से ठी सर्व मराठी अणि इंग्रजी वृत्तपत्र � all India Radio Pune Station, SM Zushi Sabhagarache, Vyavasthapakani Sarva Karmachari, Bars and Tones, Pradip Mali, Shekhar Gorgole, Apan Sarva Upasthit, Papad Sar Premi Jan, Tasaj Jani Jani Pratakshiriwa, Pratakshya Madat Kiri, Tya Sarvan Simi Mana Pasuna, Abharman Toh, Sarvan Na, Dhanya Vahatya Toh. Ek Chota Sa Nivedan Meethe Karto Hai, सोमवार दिनांक 1 अगस्त 2016 रोजी सुदर्शन कलामंच शनिवार पेट पुणे इथे संध्याकाळी 6:30 वाजता महाश्वेता देवी यांना आदरांजली वाहण्याची एक स्मरण सभा आयोजित केलेली आहे आणि वक्ता आहेत गणेश देवी डॉक्टर गणेश देवी आणि त्याच दिवशी संदेश भंडारे दिग्दर्शित महादू हा चित्रपट पण दाखवला जाणार आहे धन्यवाद आता मी प्राध्यापक के सच्चिदानंदन यंत्र भाषण हुई कैंचा भाषण अंतर श्रुत कुमार केतकर यंत्र अध्यक्षीय भाषण हुई आने में आज का कार्यक्रम संपन्न एक नंबर विनंती है आपन आपले मोबाइल फोन कृपया बंद करों ठेवा बेथ नाउ नाउ आई रिक्वेस्ट प्रोफेसर के सच्चिदानंदन टू काइंडली डिलीवर हिज लेक्चर प्लीज Chairman, uh, dear Kumar Kerka, my intimate friend, Magarim Sate, Gajanan and other organizers of this function, dear admirers of uh, Ram Bhagavad, I'm really grateful to the organizers for having honored me by inviting me to deliver this Ram Babat Memorial Lecture. I did not have the fortune to meet Ram Babat personally, but I have heard a lot about him from several of my Marathi friends. And I can imagine what kind of a man he was. Vibrant, knowledgeable, active, and always and, and a major, major cultural icon of uh, of Maharashtra and perhaps of uh, India as, as, as a country. Because we too have had similar <coughs> figures in Kerala. One of my, I would call him one of my gurus was 
someone called M. Govindan, uh, whom I always remember when I hear the stories around and about uh, Yambapat. He didn't make uh, speeches generally, but he was there everywhere and he was conversing to generations of uh, writers and thinkers in Kerala. And I'm sure Ram Bapad did something very similar, inspiring people to think and to act and to think independently like most of these major public intellectuals do. So that's why I'm, I said I'm really honored to be delivering this uh, talk. Thank you also for all the, the long introduction and the praise and well, all that um, uh, which uh, perhaps uh, undeservedly bestowed on me. I'll, uh, I'll talk uh, today, as it has been announced, on uh, what I call resistance, which I will try to define in a few minutes, and the relationship between poetry and resistance, and also bring in the idea of modernity and modernism as a kind of connecting link between poetry and resistance. <clears throat> I, would, uh, I would like to begin with a poem and maybe end with <coughs> maybe more than a poem. Um, this, is a, this is a poem I got quite some time back. It's called Gandhi and Poetry which of course Priya knows and quite a few people do know. Gandhi and poetry. Of course I write in Malayalam. These are my inadequate uh, English versions. One day a lean poem reached Gandhi's ashram to have a glimpse of the man. Gandhi spinning away his thread towards Ram took no notice of the poem waiting at his door, ashamed as he was no bhajan. The poem cleared his throat and Gandhi looked at him sideways through those glasses that had seen hell. Have you ever spun thread? he asked. Ever pulled a scavenger's cart? Ever stood the smoke of an early morning kitchen? Have you ever starved? The poem said, I was born in the woods in a hunter's mouth. A fisherman brought me up in his hamlet. You know, the reference is to what well, maybe and we asked, but it could be taken as a general kind of uh, metaphor. The poem said, I was born in the woods in a hunter's mouth. A fisherman brought me up in his hamlet. Yet I know no work. I only sing. First I sang in the courts. Then I was plump and handsome. But I'm on the streets now, half starved. That's better, Gandhi said with a sly smile. But you must give up this habit of speaking in Sanskrit at times. Go to the fields, listen to the peasant's speech. The poem turned into a grain and lay waiting in the fields for the tailor to come and upturn the virgin soil moist with the new ray. I'll, as I said, I'll begin with, uh, I'm, I'm making an attempt actually to define the idea of uh, resistance. And one way of defining resistance is to distance it or uh, differentiate it uh, from the idea of revolution. Revolution is a historical event, even if uh, the preparation for a revolution could go on for a long period of time, it happens at a specific time in a specific location. It's, it's, a, it's a moment of the 
creative or nihilistic explosion of resistance. It is related to resistance, but I would say revolution is a particular moment in the long history of resistance. It is a kind of uh, outburst, an explosion that happens uh, at, a, at a particular uh, time in a particular place. Like we speak of French, the French Revolution, the American Revolution, the Russian, the Chinese, uh, all, all, all kinds of Iranian, different kinds of revolutions. And revolutions can, perhaps they have a habit uh, of generating, uh, of uh, degenerating into its very opposite. Because the triumph and the power that follows as we have seen in every totalitarian regime that revolutions have often brought into being, corrupts people, corrupts the very people who had championed revolution uh, to, to begin with. They had originally started, most of these, uh, I mean, the revolutionaries or the pioneers of the revolution had started fighting autocracy, the hegemony of maybe feudalism, maybe capitalism, theocracy, bureaucracy. Uh, but the most revolutionary states, if you really ha I mean, take a hard look at them, re-established most of what they had fought against. Because they degenerated into themselves into autocracies and theocracies and and of course a very I mean very evil uh, bureaucracies and so in one sense I'm not condemning the idea of revolution but historically speaking all the revolutions so far but that we have seen so far have failed to realize the ideals that they stood for and fought for. From the French Revolution comes up Napoleon. America develops into what uh, thinkers like Hart and Negri would call uh, the empire. And, uh, uh, and with all the apartheid and various kinds of differences that uh, uh, the, that country has promoted among countries and among its own people. And the Russian Revolution gives rise to Stalin. And the Chinese Revolution le uh, leads to Mao Zedong and the, and the Cultural Revolution, which, uh, uh, who, which has dubious claims to being a positive revolution. The Iranian Revolution creates uh, someone like Khomeini. And all these post-revolutionary states have seen or have believed in proscriptions, censorships. They have created gulags and Siberia's prisons and labor camps. And they have created also their own martyrs like uh, Mandelstam or Solzhenitsyn in, in the Soviet Union or, or Sotayeva in the Soviet Union or Ai Ching or more recently Ai Weiwei, I mean the artist in, in China. And there has well, uh, always violent revolutions have required greater violence to sustain them. I remember uh, one of the historians writing about the Russian Revolution. Only 17 people were killed in the October Revolution, but millions were killed after the revolution during Stalin's regime. So uh, this is what makes all of us actually rethink whether violence is a legitimate or at least intelligent way of transforming the society because every violent revolution has necessitated greater violence to sustain the kind of states that they brought into, brought into being. So in one sense we can say we are living in a kind of uh, post-utopian present when 
societies and even languages get fragmented. But resistance, as different from revolution, continues even when revolutions turn sour and turn into their opposite or their our you know they they begin to serve the ideals which are which were originally against the idea of the revolution itself resistance is not an event but i would i would call it a condition a universal almost a timeless condition not something that happens of course it happens also still not something that hap that is confined to a particular date or time or a particular and specific place it is a condition because it is it is a continuing battle the continuing battle that human beings have always engaged in against every form of unfreedom inequality and injustice in every kind of society pre revolutionary or post revolutionary and there are plenty of examples like the uprising of the peasants of ukraine after the russian revolution russian revolution didn't end it began in october um, i mean uh, 1917 but then it didn't end there there after that the peasants of ukraine rose up in revolt against the the, the government's complete apathy to agriculture and and the life of the peasants and you find more recent examples like what happens in Tiananmen Square or in the WTO summit in, in Seattle, the, up, uh, the uprisings in Eastern Europe uh, often led, I mean, led mainly by intellectuals like uh, Havel, the Wall Street resistance and then the various kinds of uprisings we found, of course, you may say that all of them failed and finally they led back to a fundamentalist upsurge. But then I am speaking of the particular moment, uh, that moment when the pe uh, people took power in their hand and they tried to resist uh, the, uh, the autocratic uh, ru uh, rulers who were trying to propagate the idea of uh, dictatorship. I mean the uprisings in, 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 in Tunisia, in Yemen, in Turkey uh, recently, in Bahrain, in Syria, uh, in, in Nandigram, what happened, uh, or the, 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 the movement against uh, uh, the Narmada Dam or uh, various kinds of nuclear projects like at Kudankulam or, or, or Jethapur or, or the revolt in uh, yeah, say uh, Lalgad, uh, they are not always successful. And in fact, they have also sometimes this resistance temporarily has had to retreat or you may even say, uh, as I said, in, in, the, in the case of the Arab revolutions, they brought uh, uh, dictatorships into being or they uh, finally the theocrats, uh, 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 I mean, uh, came back. But that does not in any way reduce, I would say, the value of those uh, uh, great popular uprisings as um, Tony Chaka, who is a great architect and a great thinker, you know, uh, he, a Turkish uh, thinker and architect, uh, he, uh, he says that the Arab revolutions uh, were like, uh, uh, like seeing in a flash the possibility of a future through a tear in the sky. It is true, uh, and I think that's a beautiful and meaningful metaphor. Because it is true that future didn't happen, but you could see for a moment what exactly people could do if they really decided to take power in their hands and if they decided to resist the, the dictators and the autocrats. So, and in fact, that is exactly what resistance does, even if uh, sometimes uh, uh, it, uh, they do not always uh, lead to what you call success. They are successful in another sense that they, they, they give you the possibility of another world. They show you the possibility of another world. They tell you another world is possible, a world of justice, a world, of demo a, a, a world uh, where uh, democracy really flourishes, a world where uh, uh, power is with the people. Well, such a, such a world is possible. 
and it is that vision of a, a possibility that these uh, uh, kinds of uprisings afford that is more important than their temporary success or failure. And this is exactly what uh, you know thinkers like uh, Hart and Negri would call uh, the biopolitical resistance of the multitudes. I am sure some of you at least are familiar with uh, the works of Hart and Negri, uh, who speak about uh, I mean who, who began with their great work Empire and then they went on uh, to to look at uh, uh, these uh, new resistance movements that were happening around the world, and they they uh, and and they used uh, they used I am not going into the theoretical details of that, uh, uh, they, they called it the, the uprisings of the multitude. And they, and they distinguish the multitude from what we call the masses. It was not just the mass, but they were individuals who had come together, who were very conscious of being individuals and still they were organically linked by what they call love, simply. By love and they, they came together and they had a common cause and they, uh, they, they tried to resist and often to, uh, to uh, transform uh, the destinies imposed upon them. And in, and in that attempt, uh, and that attempt is what uh, they call a, a biopolitical resistance, something organic which also becomes political without, uh, I mean, free from the narrow meanings of the political. I mean, it's not exactly a party leading a revolution or something, but it is. But it is political in a in a larger uh, uh, human uh, human context. So, um, uh, because they are they are moved by justice and connected by united by what they call love. So, so we have witnessed such moments, the moments of the multitude, all over the world. We, 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 we saw it also, uh, also in India, at least sometimes when people rose, uh, rose up against corruption or when uh, yeah, after, the, after the rape of Nirbhaya, there was this uh, great movement in Delhi. So there were spontaneous things which, which seemed to happen all on a sudden, of course, spurred on and helped by uh, the, 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 the new social media. And still, so there, there, we have also witnessed in, in the present similar similar movements uh, which were uh, where people did not uh, people who never had seen each other came together in the same place and they they assembled they they had slogans and they and they tried to uh, to oppose what was happening uh, they tried to fight uh, uh, in injustice and I am I'm not saying that you can find exact parallels of this uh, in uh, in poetry but poets have, I would say, attempted to create parallel, parallel aesthetic and emotional structures by creating new idioms, new languages, new ways of looking at the world. That is precisely what poets try to do, to give you a new way of looking at the world because language itself is a way of looking at the world. And when you change language, you also change the way in which you try to understand the world, to interpret the world, to, uh, to, uh, to see the world. I would, because I, I would first try to define these terms, so, and then and the second term uh, in my title is uh, uh, modernism. In, in, in India, we, we, cannot, we cannot exactly speak of modernism in the context of India in the same context in which uh, we speak about uh, Western modernism. Even though it was certainly impacted by Western modernism in, in, in general. Yeah, I suddenly remember a poem by um, Charles Baudelaire, uh, the uh, the French poet. Uh, I, 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 I only quoting the poem. It is, it's like a narrative. Uh, it was one of his uh, last poems, which was published posthumously after after his death. It is about a meeting between a poet and one of his uh, readers. His reader, uh, and who was a great admirer of this poet meets uh, the poet in a dirty place in the outskirts of the city. From the description, it seems that that was uh, the backyard of the city where the pickpockets uh, and the sex workers and, 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 and similar kinds of people lived. And the reader is surprised 
to find uh, the, his dear poet uh, in such a such squalid surroundings because he had thought you know the poets always travel they they fly on the rainbows and they drink uh, the nectar of gods and how can a poet be in such a dirty and bad place and and he directly confronts the poet asks him you here and the poet says uh, yeah it was like uh, i i happened to come here by accident actually um i was walking along the road and you know i had before before coming here i had a i had a halo around my head a halo or what you call an aura there was a halo around my neck around my head and that slipped and fell on the road i wanted to pick it up but i couldn't do that because uh, vehicles were coming and i thought uh, well my life is uh, more precious than this halo so i thought let it uh, let it be there let it be uh, dropped on the street but now i think it was uh, it was something good that happened because earlier with that halo everybody would recognize me oh the poet comes but now without this halo as an ordinary human being among human beings i can go anywhere i can i can befriend common people and i can travel to places like these to understand the kind of actual life that people lead uh, of which i had no idea before because because i was confined to my my dream world you know or i was uh, like uh, i said in the um, in the gandhian poetry uh, i was singing in the courts so i knew only uh that kind of life uh, uh the the life that the uh, that the elite uh, people in the society live but now i know how the real people in real society in real time live and that so i think it was good that i lost this uh, halo he he tells this to the reader when the reader says uh, why don't you advertise that you have lost a halo and uh, you know anybody who finds it will be given a reward and all that then he says no i am not going to do that because it is better that i lost this halo so that i i have become a real human being so this is one of the ways in which you know baudelaire tries to understand understand modernism as an attempt to reconnect with humanity at large as a kind of new context that makes you look into the reality and try to create linguistic structures which actually parallel those transformations that happen in real life and in real time so to be uh, uh, i i would also quote uh, a western thinker uh, who has uh, uh, whose um, ideas have appealed to me a lot uh marshall berman has a uh, i'm sure some of you have read it a book called all that is solid melts into air that's a, that's a quote from karl marx actually all that is solid melts into the air um and and, and I, i i quote him briefly to be modern is to find ourselves in an environment that promises us adventure power joy growth transformation of ourselves and the world and at the same time that threatens to destroy everything we know everything we are modern environments and experiences cut across all boundaries of geography and ethnicity of class and nationality of religion and ideology in this sense modernity can be said to unite all mankind but it is a paradoxical unity a unity of disunity it pours us all into a millstream of perpetual disintegration and renewal of struggle and contradiction of ambiguity and anguish to be modern is to be part of a universe in which as marx said all that is solid melts into air so uh, he he is trying to look at the modern experience as a contradictory experience an experience of promise because it promises through the i mean through the massive technological transformation that it has brought about a different world at the same time 
the same modernity uh, has also promoted evil promoted war uh, you know created uh, weapons of mass destruction so on on the one hand it has created a situation that uh, helps uh, assists and abets war and on the other it has also given us certain things uh, which perhaps could be used if we are wise enough for the betterment of the world in which we live and and what we call modernism in literature was a kind of reaction to this paradoxical situation even though uh, Berman calls it a global experience yes it was global in some sense even though uh, it appeared in different uh, uh, localities at different times uh, at the same time it also had its own specific national and local forms that's why I said uh, there is a connection with the uh, Indian modernism has a connection with the Western uh, with Western modernism but you can't uh, simply impose Western modernism upon uh, the Indian uh, Indian idea of modernism or the Indian context of uh, modernism it happened in different places in different uh, in, in different contexts and the, and the responses to modernity also differed from place to place and often from uh, language to language perhaps it was also preceded by a kind of a transitional period of 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 of, of premonitions um, like you would say in in the in the case of india you, you could take a poet like um, nirala in hindi or jivananda das in, uh, in in bengali or several other other poets who of course martekar was actually into into the into modernism itself i am speaking of some poets who live uh, who were in in caught in between you know the old uh, romantic kind of poetry even though the, though the romantic word is not mechanically you can't mechanically apply it to the Indian context but then uh, because it was known by different names in different languages but what we generally call romantic and uh, and the modern they were caught between uh, these two situations and they had the premonitions of a change that was coming a change in the society a change in the language a change of form a change of idiom a change in the in the very understanding of the idea of literature and of poetry itself and so uh, so uh, all of them were torn by uh, profound conflicts and uh, and they they uh, some of these transitional poets foreshadowed a new poetics uh, that was slowly taking shape ultimately the the essence of uh, the modernist uh, reaction ag uh, against what's called this modernity was a kind of uh, it was a kind of resistance against the new urban inferno so at least in india if you look at the early uh, modernists we will realize that it was a kind of resistance against the the hells uh, the, the, the 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 infernos uh, urban infernos created by the industrial uh, revolution and the and the competitive ethos of capitalism and its commodification of everything so modernism was not merely reflecting modernity of course it happened in certain movements like the futuristic movements uh, um, uh, like the futuristic uh, uh, movement in the, in the west but mostly at least uh, in india modernists were resisting this kind of a mindless and mechanical urbanization they were trying to resist also the kind of new ethos the, the uh, of uh, of capitalism because you know it is often said that capitalism yeah who said that ernest fisher once said capitalism is a new midas uh, that touches everything and turns everything into commodity the old midas uh, you know turned everything into gold and capitalism touches something it becomes a commodity let it be a painting or let it be cricket uh, so everything is turned into commodity by its uh, evil touch and 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 uh, and the writers the, the modernist writers uh, of india were trying to resist this kind of a commodification the objectification of uh, uh, things which were so dear to them values which were so dear to them uh, so the, and they were reacting against the loss of a primary a human human values uh, uh, but uh, as i said it it uh, it also had a very specific context uh, aesthetic context as well as social context in the uh, uh, um, in india in india the context of modernism perhaps were at least some of the contexts were the one is partition the partition of india which uh, 
uh, Anand Shankar Rai uh, calls uh, an elemental psychic experience. It was something elemental, something that deeply troubled you, a, a very intensely traumatic kind of experience of the country being divided and people, you know, uh, and you know, all the exodus that happened and the bloodshed. We were just talking about it before we came here. Uh, the, the bloodshed and the, and the, and the exodus, the, uh, which nobody, had, perhaps nobody had foreseen, at least in that kind of scale. So there was, a, so that was one of the specific Indian contexts of, of modernism. However much I might try to force a chuckle on my lips, there is no real cheer in the desert of my heart. This is the Gujarati poet Uma Shankar Joshi speaking about uh, uh, the dawn of freedom. People were not happy. We, we should have been happy. We should have been celebrating freedom. But freedom came with so much of blood that it was unacceptable to any real human being. And so poets uh, responded against that. So that's what, and, that, and this is, uh, these are Uma Shankar Joshi's lines. Uh, the, uh, that is, however, however, however much I might try to force a chuckle on my lips, there is no real cheer in the desert of my heart. And uh, Vishnu Day called it life in death or death in life. What had really happened during, uh, during, uh, or immediately in the, in the aftermath of the freedom struggle. And corpses entomb the fields today. Blood overflows the chinab. This is Amrita Pritham, the, the, uh, the Punjabi poet. Corpses entomb the fields today and blood overflows the Chinab. And, and from the other side also, it was not confined to the so-called uh, India. Uh, 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 Faisal Ahmad Fais, uh, who is considered a Pakistani poet, of course, you know, it's very, very difficult to, uh, uh, to, uh, to divide poets of that period as Pakistani or Indian. So, uh, Faiz Ahmad Faiz uh, from the other side, uh, you know, you know people like Manto, for example, and Faiz belong to the, that, that tribe of uh, uh, um, Hassan Manto. Uh, Faiz says, this is not the longed for break of day, not that clear dawn in quest of which our comrades set out. Disillusionment, so, so you find this disillusionment among the poets of partition. Um, from in, in Urdu, you you will find uh, from like poets like uh, uh, Makdum uh, uh, Mohyuddin to uh, poets uh, of Manipur like Samarendra. I mean, it it was spread all over all over India. Even though, uh, of course, it, the the most intense expressions were found in Punjab and Bengal because they were the states most affected by partition. But then they they had their reverberations across the whole country and across the literatures of, of the country. I don't think there is any language in India uh, in which there is a, there is not at least one novel and a few poems around uh, the tragedy and the trauma of uh, partition. And uh, so um, uh, um, Agge is uh, the island-like solitude about which uh, Agge, uh, you know, S.H. Valsi and the Hindi poet speaks, or the sense of enveloping darkness in a, a major Hindi poet like uh, Mukti Both, you know, one of his uh, longer poems is called Andhere Me in, 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 in darkness. So, uh, uh, and, and these, they may not specifically refer to the partition, but the partition was very much in the background of the kind of uh, extreme anguish that many of these poets experienced at, at that point of time. And and then and and you find and uh, you find also this kind of a gloom uh, in many of the poems of Omar Thakur, in Jivananda Das, in Sachi Rautroy from uh, Orissa uh, or um, Naukan Barua from Assam, Gobal Krishnadiga from um, uh, from uh, Karnataka, from in in Harbhajan Singh, in uh, Sundari Ramaswamy of Tamil, in Ayyappa Panikkar of uh, Malayalam, in Abdul Rahman Rahi of Kashmir. I mean, you can name uh, some of the. These were some of the pioneers of what we call the modernist movement in literature, in in poetry, and in all of them you find this gloom casting a, a dark shadow, and their language seems to be working uh, you know in 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 some kind of a penumbra i mean a kind of area of uh, a semi dark kind of area and 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 they have also these uh, terrible uh, images uh, powerful images uh, of i remember panikers line um, corpses uh, waiting to wake up 
in the cradles. So strange, paradoxical, morbid, sometimes morbid, often surrealistic images, which characterized a lot of uh, early writing and even later writing in uh, modernist writing. And uh, they have this kind of a terrible background. This uh, what uh, what earlier Anand Shankar they called that elemental psychic experience that shocked you, that uh, that traumatized you, and that uh, changed your whole being and the whole way of looking at uh, your society. I mean, we are capable of so much of cruelty. You know, this this awareness that, that that's what every tragedy gives us. This kind of awareness: Are we capable of so much of cruelty? Whether it is a rape, whether it is the attack on a Dalit, whether it is uh, you know a, a com communal riot, uh, and whenever there is violence in the country the first feeling i have and most of you have is is it possible can uh, human beings be so unkind and so cruel and so uh, uh, can life be so oppressive so there was along with partition as a context of modernism in india the loss of uh, Gandhian values in public life there was a gradual vanishing a disappearance of the values for which uh, gandhi stood and a continuing exploitation, discrimination, I mean, which continued even after freedom, and a depletion of rural life. Uh, as you very well know, a lot of villagers were coming to cities like Bombay looking for jobs. You know, that if you remember the early Hindi films, you will remember, uh, you, will, you will easily see that, uh, that, that kind of an impact that lot of villagers coming and and getting lost in the city and being even robbed in the city and all that this is a typical you know the Bimal Roy kind of uh, you know in, in those films you find a lot of uh, these uh, uh, it's an actual reflection of what was ac happening at that time uh, so there's a gradual depletion uh, a kind of loss of meaning of uh, rural life and rural life itself and and this huge uh, movement demographic movements uh, which were impelled by very often by uh, unemployment uh, 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 and some uh, sometimes caused by riots and very often caused by unemployment people moving in large masses from the villages to the cities from one place to the other and the marginalization the general marginalization of the common people who had actually fought for independence. You know, even of course, we say Gandhi fought for independence, but then without people, you know, there can't, there can't be a leader. So clearly, it was because of the battle of the common people that finally we won freedom, and the same common people became the, the, the victims in the post-independence era. So those who had fought for independence, they were getting more and more marginalized and there was uh, this accumulation of wealth in some hands selfishness uh, careerism of the new middle classes uh, which uh, which uh, led to a kind of uh, philistinism a, a loss of uh, a loss of real uh, real values uh, and and the intrusion of the market on everyday life which we keep seeing growing even even now so that is what uh, creates images like uh, you know yeah, mukti bodh has a famous poem uh, called the the face of the moon is Crooked. So uh, that that kind of uh, uh, disco discovering the moon anew in a in a, as as a, as a kind of monstrous dream rather than a sweet romantic uh, you know uh, uh, vision. Uh, so that uh, uh, you you find similar expressions in many of the poets of uh, uh, that uh, that period. Uh, Kedarnath Singh spoke of the Anagat, uh, the one who, who is yet to come, the Anagat whose wings were lost in the golden shadows and feet trembling in the mist. So the one who wanted to come but who could never come. I mean the, the, the kind of real freedom that we wanted, the real democracy that we wanted, which uh, seems to be getting caught, uh, uh, trapped, uh, whose wings seem to have been trapped among the uh, among the clouds or among the, the, among the rather dark clouds and so uh, it's unable to really make its appearance. So there was a, there was a kind of uh, Mm, catastrophic vision, a tragic, a catastrophic kind of uh, vision, uh, uh, which could perhaps, uh, I mean, those students of English literature would be remem uh, would remember Yeats's poem, like the Second Coming. So there was a kind of uh, that that uh, terrible, uh, scary kind of uh, vision, a dark premonition of something of a 
you know remember that beast moving towards bethlehem to be born in uh, in yates's uh, second coming so there was this feeling that there was a huge beast moving to be born in bethlehem no more jesus it is the an anti jesus who is going to be uh, go going to be born now this feeling seemed to have, uh, have overtaken i mean a lot of uh, a lot of uh, poetry and uh, giving poets very uh, dark visions about uh, about the future that's the very situation that Yeats spoke about the best lack all conviction and the worst are full of passionate intensity so this feeling the best lack all conviction and the worst are full of passionate intensity that you know, it's a continuing experience that we that we even now have uh, so uh, the best seem to be not believing in anything because they have lost their faith in politics they have lost their faith in many things while the worst are always you know very active and uh, very passionate and they have uh, they have all all those uh, deceptive slogans to uh, to entrap you and to and to destroy you so so this disillusionment was primarily i would say a kind of uh, ontological di uh, di disillusionment uh, 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 sometimes uh, it was also individualistic and solipsistic as as expressed in many of the modern early early or what is called high modernist uh, uh, poems so uh, i mean they reacted differently escape uh, agony uh, black humor the use uh, irony uh, and then uh, uh, the, uh, a kind of discontinuity of structure various uh, new kinds of metaphoric modes so they they try to create a language a, 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 to uh, to reflect the fragmentation that was happening in the in in the society and and that is exactly how poetry reacts to situations by by bringing something of that into the language and trying to uh, to create a new language uh, which uh, sometimes may be broken fragmented like uh, um, if you know paul celan's poetry you know a po poetry that came out of auschwitz came out of the german concentration camps a kind of broken poetry where he is not able to relate to what is happening and i uh, completely uh, like, like an alien you you just look at because his parents had died in the in the concentration camp and so he could no more speak uh, in that continuous easy flowing continuous romantic language and he had to invent a new german language to speak of the experience of uh, of nazism and what what it, what it really did to the german society and and as you very well know a lot of writers ran away from germany uh, saying that uh, we cannot save our language if we live here our language will be the marrow of our language will be filled with untruth if we live, if we continue to live here because so much of lies are being said and uh, and all the media uh, all, all seem to be always lying and so so you often find we perhaps we also are trying to uh, finding ourselves in a situation where we feel that so much of lie so much of untruth is getting into the marrow of language and in that language it becomes very difficult to express uh, you know uh, uh, to articulate uh, uh, beautifully articulate connectedly so language loses its connection and and then you have to try I, I will speak about that a little late, later too that uh, you have to try new kinds of juxtapositions you have to you have to get the truth out of language by beating it sometimes and breaking it uh, you know that kind of uh, so this kind of an intense encounter with life also gets reflected in an intense encounter with language which transforms the idiom which changes the way you look at life you look at poetry you look at uh, the kind of life uh, ar ar around you <coughs> uh so the so he, uh, there so there was this disillusionment for which they were trying to find a, a, a language a language of uh, irony black humor various ways in which uh, the uh, state could uh, well be expressed and and yet uh, uh, it it had it it, it, it its cry was uh, a, a radical because it cried one one uh, because uh, often modernists are accused of uh, uh, you know standing with the slogan art for art's sake uh, i think uh, many of them who accuse them of that do not know that the the slogan art for art's sake was raised precisely against capitalism and against all those forces which are trying to appropriate art uh, art for art's sake really meant art is not for the for 
the promotion of capital art is not for the promotion of dictatorship and totalitarianism that is precisely what was originally meant by the slogan and they were attacked as communists and all kinds of things the people who write this slogan art for art's sake even the later our progressives found something wrong with that slogan and they and they divided art between art for art's sake and art for life's sake and all that which is a which i think is a completely outmoded uh, way of looking at things an outmoded argument so um, it was a it was a very radical statement when you say we, we are artists and art is for art art is not for you art is not for you or king or or, or dictator uh, or capitalist art is not for you that is exactly what they were trying to say so that was a kind of uh, a radical stance uh, at least when it was first raised i don't know whether it was it has been misused later but originally it was raised as a very radical kind of aesthetic slogan so because it is a denial as i said of a uh, of art in in service of capital in service of state or in service of what today you may call nation a particular kind of nation uh, or bureaucracy or the or the uh, market uh, and the and it was an assertion of all art as an expression of uh, of freedom and hence also of uh, of resistance to everything that is dark and oppressive so 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 there was at, at the core of Modernism, modernism in literature and in art there was a kind of rebellion there was a kind of resistance against those forces which were trying to appropriate art and turn it into a, a kind of a commodity or something that would uh, that would help uh, assist, uh, assist their growth and their cause um, so you find, I mean, even even in the uh, even uh, in the West or in the East, you find that. And if you if you go through the works of uh, Ernest Fischer or Ernest Bloch or uh, Bertolt Brecht or Walter Benjamin, it is not difficult to find how uh, they stood against uh, some of the superficial uh, uh, perceptions about modernism that you find in you know again the, the, these people whom I named were Marxists, but those people whom they opposed were also uh, uh, Marxists in a way, uh, Plihanov and uh, Georg Lukacs. You, you, I'm sure some of you know of the, I'm not going into that, but a, a, a long argument between, um, uh, uh, between um, uh, um, um, Walter Benjamin on one side, Walter Benjamin and Alexander Bloch on one side and uh, 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 Lukács on, on the other. Because Lukács was against Kafka. He said Kafka is reactionary, Kafka is retrogressive. But uh, um, uh, these people argued, Fisher and, uh, the, uh, and other uh, critics argued, no. Kafka, Kafka was a radical because he, he told you what exactly is happening and what is going to happen through a story like Metamorphosis of Grigor Samsa or through the situations in the castle or in the trial or in, or in America. In all those major works of Franz Kafka, you find a kind of premonition of what is going to happen. I mean, the, the, the man, uh, a kind of uh, downward evolution that Beckett also spoke of, you know, or, or Ionesco tried to portray through his uh, rhinoceros so a kind of downward evolution man turning into uh, you know uh, uh, rhino or man turning into uh, a, 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 an insect as in kafka's metamorphosis i mean he was um, I, I, you, I, you remember that Gregor some first anxiety uh, when he finds that he has turned into a uh, an insect is uh, um, uh, how can i reach my office in time oh my boss will you know abuse me for having been late because that bureaucracy creates that kind of a uh, 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 psychic uh, fear in you, a kind of fear in you that even when you are you are turned into a little uh, insect, uh, your anxiety is that now I cannot even walk fast like I used to do when I was a human being, and so I'll be very late to reach my you know that must have been Kafka's own experience in the bank because he was a bank officer like like many modernists. Strangely, uh, I think we need to find the connections. Eliot also, Eliot, Eliot also was a you know working in a bank, and so, uh, so uh, <laughs> because. It have, and the bank is a, a symbol, you know, it's a, it's a symbol of a symbol of capitalism ultimately, because that is where all the wealth uh, accumulates, and and uh, so that way maybe that kind of a uh, an organic connection one may find in uh, Kafka's uh, uh, you know nightmarish world. So uh, so if you look at Kafka or um, Samuel Beckett or Ionesco or Eliot or Orden, many of these people where they they exposed in some sense, even they did not spell it out, but they were actually exposing the emerging capitalist uh, the capitalist society the emerging society of hollow men to use uh, 
the title of one of Eliot's famous poems. The, the, the hollow men who were coming up. Your life is split in two and you are passing through such a contradictory and paradoxical uh, condition of existence. And so they were trying to exactly tell, uh, uh, tell people what they were passing through. To, to they, were, they, they were informants, in, uh, informed informants who tried to tell people what 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 they actually were becoming so there was a actually it was a kind of denunciation of uh, of decay of, of decadence which was misunderstood as decadence by some of the early 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 progressives and maybe late progressives too i'm not sure um, so uh, i think we are as i said uh, we are really speaking we are past the controversy between the moderns and the progressives. I think probably in Marathi also it happened, but it happened almost in all the major Indian languages because they denounced all the moderns as decadent and, uh, you know, they were uh, as, uh, yeah, decadence was the word. Lukács was the pioneer. Lukács was the one who brought that, because they hadn't read anything beyond Lukács because even, even in Marxism things were happening and, you know, a lot of people were defending modernism, but because they stopped with Lukács, they thought, uh, uh, well, yeah, we will stop here and call everybody decadent. So, but anyway, I think uh, that battle uh, is uh, no more. I mean, it doesn't hold any, any, any uh, hold water now, hold, hold any meaning now. <coughs> um, but uh, uh, yeah, and, and there was also this uh, uh, disillusionment, disillusionment about the revolutions that happened ha happened later. Uh, you know, uh, on the, um, the USSR, China, East European experiences. Uh, so, and after that, I think we should no more uh, go back to that old battle between art for art's sake and art for life's sake or modernists and the progressives and all that. Because uh, uh, we have seen what, what happened also to the kind of revolutions that were waged and waged rightly for justice. I, I, I would never decry the revolutions themselves because behind that there was the energy of uh, a lot of people who gave their life uh, to realize uh, the great dream of an egalitarian human society. But sadly that didn't happen. Uh, uh, which, is, uh, which is not to say that uh, the idea of revolution has become, uh, I mean, uh, uh, outdated, but to say that uh, the, the outcome of the, we have to critically evaluate the outcome of the kind of revolutions that happened, and then naturally we will have to also critically evaluate the means used for transformation, which were ultimately violent means, which required, as I said, more violence to sustain itself after the, after the revolution. <coughs> so the, uh, the important thing that the modernists shared was the, the famous slogan by Yesra Pound, make it new. They were trying to make it new. And they were trying to create new idioms, new styles, new ways of looking at life. They were, be, uh, they were uh, um, um, creating a kind of experimental uh, literature, experimental theater, experimental, it happened all over, uh, experimental films, to express the, uh, the, the new complexities. And so they, they broke the canons, they created uh, or at least tried to create new forms and they sought a kind of aesthetic liberation from the conservative confines. Uh, so they, they thought that it is better to sacrifice the conservative concept of poetry in this case and art in general uh, for the realities of life rather than sacrifice the realities to preserve the conservative concept of poetry. Because this was the kind of challenge before the modernists. So, if you, you could go on writing in the old fashion, but then you will be sacrificing the reality of life. So, so they had to ch make a choice. You, whether to continue in the conservative fashion and sacrifice uh, their uh, the, uh, the link, arts link with reality or to ch challenge the conservative concepts and create something new and as re-establish uh, the, the thinning links between reality and art. Um, so uh, so it, um, um, uh, those people who believed that uh, the new reality, the new very complex reality needed a new language, a new, new idiom to articulate it, they, they were the people who chose to experiment, to, to chose to cre create a new kind of poetry, a new kind of uh, fiction, a new kind of uh, you know, art and film and everything else. So uh, there was a new understanding also of the, of, of, of the, of, of the tradition. Because the tradition in many earlier discourses, it was looked upon as something that is dead and something that is out there. And then 
Yeah, so this there was a tradition on one side and modernity on the other. That was another uh, debate that I think in every language you, you find that old debate between tradition and modernity. But Eliot himself had, uh, you know, tried to, uh, to define that relationship uh, uh, saying, uh, you know, the famous essay tradition and individual talent, where he says the individual talent tries to shift the tradition a little, each talent, and I would, I would uh, actually prefer um, Ekeria Manujan's uh, metaphor to Eliot's metaphor. You know, Ekeria Manujan uh, tells us a, a story, not a story, a, a situation, um, and um, some of you may know that too. Uh, there was a woodcutter, a woodcutter who claimed that uh, uh, his axe, the axe he was using to, to cut wood, uh, had come from his grand 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 grandfather i mean and it is always the same and 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 the man, and the um, the employer asked the woodcutter so nothing changed is it the same axe you say is the handle the same and the woodcutter no no how can it be because you know, so many generations so the naturally i had to change the handle many times and uh, uh, and and what about uh, what about that uh, the axe itself the the uh, uh, what about that iron part of it uh, uh, the blade uh, then he said yeah the blade also naturally I have to change because it's iron you know it, I, so I so the uh, the blade is changed and the handle is changed uh, so many times and still he claimed that it was the same axe not not because he was a fool but actually this I think this has this uh, 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 it has something to say about tradition and modernity that is gradually and you so you go on what you call tradition I would say is nothing but a series of innovations in every age if, if you look at literature if you look at poetry which is my theme for the time being so you, in every age poets went on changing not that uh, um, uh, only today it is happening in every, uh, every in every age you find poets who had challenged the existing idiom and created a new idiom and it is this continuity of uh, innovations and experiments that you call tradition so it is not something out there, something dead, something you should worship. It is, it is, it is in you, and and you are changing it, and you also become part of that. You know, people like us who began to write in the 60s are now part of the tradition. For the for a new young poet who begins to write, we are part of the tradition, and and uh, and, and we don't mind being part of the tradition either, because uh, that is how tradition is made. Tr tradition is continually uh, uh, being reconstructed. It doesn't remain unchanged. It keeps. Uh, Getting rid and all those arguments, uh, you know, how how stupid they look now. In the beginning, in the 1960s, 50s, and 60s, all those arguments now look though so stupid because modern modernism has become the mainstream of all literatures, and so no one will now dare question. Even though in the beginning we were all questioned, we were we were told you are not a poet, you are not this because you are not using meter, you are not using rhyme and rhythm properly, and all that. All of us were attacked. But then I don't think now any, any intelligent uh, critic or reader would uh, would do that. That is exactly what happens gradually you know new, uh, new things get absorbed into the mainstream and that also becomes part of the tradition even part of the canon sometimes it's our poems are now in textbooks so uh, which is a sad thing to happen but then yeah. <laughs> but it happens but it happens yeah because uh, you have you you have an you know, escape from being part of the canon being part of the tradition if you go on right uh, uh, sadly you go on living for long and you keep on writing for long <coughs> Um, so I, I I I remember a text particularly, which was a kind, which was an inter, an Indian text, an introduction written by U R Anantamurthy and D R Nagaraj together. You know, they published an anthology called Vibhava in English, which, to my knowledge, is the first ever anthology of Indian modernist writing. This was published by a small publisher, Tiger or something, some small publisher in Bangalore actually. But it was a path-breaking anthology because they tried to bring together writings uh, mainly from South India and maybe a, a, a bit from outside, some, some samples of new writing. It is a casual anthology in that sense, uh, but they had some very insightful things to say in their introduction. I think it was Nagaraj who wrote the introduction because I can, I can see his mischief in the, in the introduction because you, I don't know whether you know dear. He, he, he died uh, very young, but he was an acute, uh, acutely intelligent uh, kind of critic and a social critic also. Uh, you know, he wrote that famous book, The Flaming Feet, which was the first intelligent book about Dalit, Dalit writing and Dalit uprising. Uh, so, uh, Nagaraj, uh, let me attribute it to Nagaraj anyway, they or Anandamuthi Noha, uh, they used the word patricide for the initial 
uh, the, the, act, the action of the initial early modernists. So in every language, a patricide happened. And I mean, a killing of the father. And even though later this father was sometimes restored, like in the, the Tagore is the best example. Because, I, because actually, actually uh, he also uses, uh, um, Nagara uses the word Tagore syndrome. Tagore, Tagore syndrome, because you had Tagores in all the languages at a particular moment of time. I don't want to name anybody, I can name, I can name at least some 14 Tagores. Uh, I that point. So, uh, so everybody imitated Tagore, because Tagore was the icon, Tagore was the model, Tagore was uh, the, the paradigm. And so there were so many poets who tried to write like Tagore, even though Sadly, many of them lacked the Tagore's vision because he had a great understanding because he was also an intellectual if you because I now read his essays again and again with a, a great uh, um, I mean I, I, I get a lot of insights into what is happening now to the idea of nationalism and all that so uh, so Tagore, uh, but at that point of time uh, the Bengali poets found it necessary uh, to challenge Tagore because they felt they were under the shadow, they were overshadowed by this huge figure of Tagore and they had to get out of that info, otherwise they could not create anything of their own because they would, they would all become small Tagores and they could never become a big, a, a big Tagore uh, unless they, you put all of them together. So, because, <laughs> so, so they thought that they had to somehow escape uh, you know, uh, this, uh, this shadow of uh, Tagore and uh, uh, so they fought against the Tagore syndrome and that is how Vishnu De, Subhash Mahobadhyay, uh, you know, um, Sunil Gangobad, a lot of poets of that period, they created another kind of poetry which was free from uh, the kind of metaphysics uh, that, uh, that you find in Tagore and also free from many of the Tagore's, uh, uh, the Tagore's ideas because Tagore's poetry uh, uh, was uh, um, uh, woven around uh, faith faith in God, faith in progress, faith in love, everything. While modernist poetry was often created around doubt, despair, interrogation. And so this was the kind of challenge they were throwing to Tagore and, and like that in every language some kind of a patricide happened. You know, in my language also there was a poet Wallathol who was a very patriotic poet and all that. Uh, but none of us were in, um, I mean, uh, none of the modernists uh, was inspired by uh, Wallathol. They tried to create a, a, a new kind of poetry, away from, even though Wallathol was the, the poet of the period, like Tagore in, in, in Bengali and perhaps all over India. So you, so you had Subramanian you had, um, you know, you had such poets in all the all the uh, all languages. But and these poets tried to break free of that. Uh, the N S Bendre, Bharati Dasan, Rajendra Shah, Sumitra I mean, I could name a lot of the, I mean, uh, um, almost Tagorean poets. And, and but these new poets tried to break free from them. And and they questioned. Uh, uh, they also questioned a kind of constructed Indianness that negated it's the ethnic, cultural, and religious diversity, and the and the, plur, uh, the plurality of languages, and the worldviews, and the cosmologies, which has suddenly become significant now. Because at that moment, perhaps even they didn't know that uh, this is going to be uh, their their work is going to be reread for a di different reason at a time when our diversity is being challenged and a kind of uh, unreal, artificial homogeneity is being imposed upon us. So they uh, so so they questioned that, that idea of India. They, are, they were not questioning the idea of India itself, but they had a different idea of India. I mean, they, I mean, they were questioning the, the, uh, that constructed kind of Indianness that seemed to overlook all the differences. You know, it's uh, overlooked the difference of uh, the, the uh, race and caste and culture and uh, the, diver uh, the various uh, diversity of religions and the plurality of uh, languages and culture, uh, regional cultures and all that and to create, a, to create an India on the tomb of what is actually Indian. So that is exactly what uh, was being tried by some people then and uh, it is being continued by uh, more people now uh, <laughs> not some so uh, uh, that's yes. so so i would not say that modernism was a, a kind of a pastish because that is a major critique that uh, a younger Marxist critic, Jayadev, who was also a fellow at the Indian Institute of Advanced Studies, uh, he wrote this book there uh, called uh, uh, Modernism as a Kind of Cultural Pastish. Uh, but I would say that it was a kind of aesthetic necessity. It was, no, uh, it was not an imitation of what happened in the West, but there was a context in India. There was a context, as I, as I explained uh, in detail, the partition, the kind of despair that followed uh, freedom 
struggle. So there was a clear, concrete context for that kind of a change in India. And aesthetically also it was necessary because uh, uh, the so-called uh, uh, romanticism, what is called Kalpanik or Chayavadi or in different, it's known in different names, so that was getting exhausted uh, through imitation. I would not blame the pioneers. In the beginning it was something new. But there were a lot of, you know, we had a poet called Changambura Krishnapillai. And then we had a thousand Changambura Krishnapillai. I mean, everybody, everybody would be, everybody would be writing, uh, trying to imitate him and trying to, and so poetry lost, uh, I mean, it turned into a kind of cliche and it was necessary to escape uh, this cliche and to create something new. So it was an aesthetic necessity on the one hand and a social necessity on the, on the, uh, on the other hand. And that is why uh, during those times there were remappings of mythology, uh, new, uh, new kinds of uh, what I would call psychogeographies being made, uh, fresh images, surreal expressions, syncopated rhythms, novel patterns, uh, and different kinds of syntax and various kinds of combinatorial plays of the folk and the classical, the indigenous and the exotic. And many of these distinctions were, uh, you know, g getting erased and which, which was which was necessary and which is perhaps even now necessary. And, and they were also fighting on the one hand the romantic excesses and on the other the facile optimism of some of the some of the progressives and uh, uh, which is proving uh, very more relevant uh, perhaps today <coughs> So what we called modern, what we call modernism was ultimately uh, a major aesthetic aesthetic break, and uh, and so you had a, a series of uh, masterpieces of that period. If you if you look back at the, uh, in their own time, they were not considered masterpieces. But if you look back, as I said, the Mukti Bodh's uh, Andhere Me, or uh, you know Siddham Shu's Magan poems, or Gobalakrishna Diga's uh, Bhumi Gite, or Ayyappa Panikkar's Kurukshetram, and some of Mathakal poems. I mean, you could. You could name a lot of uh, long and short poems, which be which later became the classics of Indian 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 modernism. Now, I, I would now try to connect this whole idea with uh, uh, with uh, aesthetic, what I would call aesthetic, the aesthetics of resistance. <clears throat> so, how do you how do we define the aesthetics of resistance? Now, one can also simplify that. Uh, say if you look at uh, Lennon's song, Imagine, or uh, Bob Marley's famous line, you know, get up, stand up, stand up for our rights. Simple, very simple. Uh, but, there is, but the essence of resistance perhaps uh, could be found even in those simple uh, lines of song. Uh, so there was, but then there was a more self, uh, as I said, modernism was a kind of resistance, but there was a more self-conscious turn towards resistance uh, in Indian poetry since the 1970s. What uh, you are Anandamurthy later called the flowering of the backyard. That's a beautiful metaphor actually because women, Dalits, you know, marginalized people, various kinds of religious and sexual minorities, they were rising up and there was, there was a flowering happening, not in the front yard as it happened earlier, but in the backyard. There was uh, this flowering of the backyard happening in the 70s. And Baudelaire's poem perhaps fits what happened in the, in the 70s and later than perhaps what happened in the 50s and 60s. So there were, uh, the, the um, and it had a social context as you very well know, there was this, uh, this uh, um, uh, praising of the Dalits, of the Adivasis, of women, of uh, various uh, ethnic and uh, sexual minorities, uh, of landless peasants, uh, craftsmen, workers, uh, dispossessed, and those who were driven away from their lands by the uh, grand uh, kind of development schemes that benefited only the privileged. And so, so that, brought, that perhaps brought into play uh, again a new kind of poetry, a second wave of modernism. I would not, I would not also say that it is more because then we will we will not know where to stop. We will have to go on saying post 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 modernism because every every decade. So I would not say that. I would say that it is a second phase or a new phase of of, of modernism, uh, and also applying post modernism the concept of post modernism from the West uh, mechanically on the Indian situation also may not be true because here what happened after modernism is slightly different from what happened in the West uh, in post modernist uh, um, art or film or, or or even in poetry. 
So something like uh, um, what uh, Pablo Neruda called impure poetry was happening. Uh, po I mean, uh, as against the pure poetry of the past, uh, there was uh, a new kind of poetry uh, which could be called impure, which uh, Neruda himself has defined like this. I have always wanted the hands of people to be seen in my poetry. I have always preferred a poetry where the fingerprints show, a poetry of loam where the water can sing, a poetry of bread where everyone may eat. A poetry of bread where everyone may eat, a poetry of loam where water can, water can sing. A poetry that carries the eternal stamp of humanity outside and inside every object, worn by constant use, full of smoke and sweat, food stains and shame, wrinkles, observations, dreams, prophecies, declarations of love and hatred, stupidities and shocks, doubts and denials and affirmations and celebrations, carrying the dust of distances, smelling of lilies and of piss, impure, like a rag, like the body. So this is how Neruda defines, uh, you know, this, uh, this uh, what, what he calls impure poetry. So because something that takes in, a kind of poetry that takes in everything and makes it an organic part of the larger body of what we, what we call uh, uh, poetry. Something like the human body uh, or what he calls something like a rag, something that has, um, that has everything in it, all kinds of, you know, de denials and affirmations and, you know, um, love and hatred, various kinds of things, I mean, which is totally human because Fortunately, we are not gods, and so and uh, so so he he speaks of a, he speaks of a, a poetry that is completely humane, that has a, that has all the base instincts of man and also the higher instincts of man, that has a, all the weaknesses of man and all the strengths of man. So that way, man in the sense human being, of course. Uh, uh, so and and that and 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 another poet. Um, uh, the Polish poet uh, uh, Rosevich, Tadeusz Rosevich, a major, major uh, Polish poet, he uh, he has also said something. He said it in the po the, uh, the post-war context and in the post-concentration camp context. Uh, he he uh, he defines uh, the new poetry like this: a poetry for the horror-stricken, uh, for those abandoned to butchery, for survivors created out of a remnant of words, salvaged words, out of uninteresting words from the great rubbish dump. This is precisely what Paul Celan did, or Holderlin, and a lot of poets uh, of the uh, the poets uh, uh, of the Nazi period and the post-Nazi period, uh, they were clearly doing that. They were creating a new poetry for those who were stricken by, by horror, for those who had survived hell, the hell of Auschwitz and Buchenwald and all those uh, terrible concentration camps. So, uh, so, so it was a poetry that cr was created not necessarily with very interesting and uh, kind of words, but sometimes with uninteresting words which were picked up from the from the uh, rubbish that was left by uh, the Nazis and and the war mongers. So. Uh, that I have often quoted this as a kind of response to uh, the famous saying of uh, Theodore Adorno, uh, the Frankfurt thinker. Adorno once said, poetry is impossible after Auschwitz. Poetry is impossible after Auschwitz. By which I do not think that he really meant it literally that poetry is impossible. What he meant was, what is called poetry, you know, that, that was impossible. That the kind of, uh, uh, the kind of sweet, uh, you know, the melodious kind of poetry, uh, that was poetry. Poetry, uh, that kind of poetry, a poetry which only speaks of uh, of bulbuls and you know that 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 kind of poetry, that was perhaps uh, not very not not being possible now. Perhaps we need. Well, he was also pointing to the need for a new kind of poetry when he said poetry is impossible because the kind of poet the. the the way in which we had defined poetry, that kind of poetry is impossible after after Auschwitz, and uh, um, um, and again, um, yeah, you remember uh, Bertolt uh, Brecht also. I mean, this is a famous. Uh, uh, some, uh, these are famous lines uh, saying, uh, "Will there be poetry in bad times?" It has been translated in different ways. Somebody has translated, "Will there be singing in uh, bad times?" So, will there be poetry in bad times? Yes poetry about bad times. So poetry does not cease to be because the times are bad. Instead poetry attempts to cope with it, to articulate 
that period the the, the what whatever is bad in the period to, to tell people that this is a bad time so it is not running away uh, because oh these are bad times and so we we may stop writing poetry but instead poetry is trying to stand straight and confront the evil to confront the evil articulate the evil tell the people that there, there this evil is reigning and uh, and uh, ruining you and uh, and so it, uh, and again um, Another Polish poet, Czesławmi Wosz, whom I like a lot, um, has also this, um, uh, these lines. In a room where people unanimously maintain a conspiracy of silence, one word of truth sounds like a pistol shot. So, so I have seen this silence. I, I, I was... I, I was saying that in the morning that uh, I saw this in Gujarat after what was after the Gujarat genocide. Uh, I'm not blaming all the Gujaratis, but at least uh, <laughs> a lot of Gujarati writers. Um, I found uh, it was a stunning silence when a, a whole genocide had happened in a state. I, I, I believe the primary it is one of the primary duties of uh, writers uh, as human beings to respond to that in some way. I'm not saying that everybody should write poetry, but in some way they have to respond to that. But I found uh, it was not exactly forthcoming, except maybe a very few writers who were not as famous as those writers who kept silent. And so, uh, so, so, so that is what you call a conspiracy of silence. You decided to remain silent because it is not safe to speak out. Like, like in our own time, you may be killed, like Kalburgi. So, so uh, at a time like this, when everybody is um, uh, affected by everybody is scared, that that precisely is. The writer's moment. That precisely is the moment when the writer, the artist, should should speak out and should say this is not right. And and I think it is uh, it is a primary duty of uh, uh, of uh, we, uh, of human beings and and particularly of writers who are supposed to uh, reflect the highest in the human beings to respond to situations like that in in their own way. I am not saying that they should all respond in the same way, but in some way, some individual way, they they they. They respond. Uh, so, so it is. So it is in that room filled with the conspiracy of silence. When somebody speaks one word of truth, it sounds like a pistol shot because it disturbs everybody. It, uh, I mean, it. Uh, it seems to interrogate everybody, and uh, and it is uh, that that poetry I am speaking of when I speak of the poetry, the post 70s poetry. And and again, uh, Miwash, uh, you who have wronged a simple man bursting into laughter at his suffering do not feel safe the poet remembers you may kill him a new one will be born deeds and talks will be recorded so poetry as witness poetry that uh, reflects the times. I mean, you may not. You may not. I am not saying that you should loudly, you know, create a poetry of slogans and all that. What I mean is that, if you read somebody's poetry, you should get some idea of the time that uh, he or she is passing through. The uh, because uh, not not directly by uh, reacting to incidents. Uh, there is nothing wrong because I have continuously re reacted to actual incidents. But then, at least by reflecting the state. By reflecting the condition, the, the human condition of a particular period, that um, no, even Kabir did that. Yeah, I mean, I mean the, if you look at the best of the Bhakti poets, uh, even they, uh, they. I mean, you could you could very well see Kabir society if you read Kabir. And this is true about Tukaram. This is true about uh, Namdev. So, so if you look at them, so or, 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 across periods, uh, the the best of poets have in some way. Uh, recorded res uh, reality or responded to the human condition in their own time without de necessarily declaring that oh this is this is what is happening in our time etc they may declare they may not declare but ultimately they in some direct or indirect way reflect uh, uh, the the society the, in which uh, they live and also uh, uh, decry uh, the evils of that society <coughs> So this is this. So uh, uh, what I'm speaking about is uh, what I earlier called a poetry of witness, that looks uh, face to face at the at the noonday and tear off 
uh, the mask, uh, tears of the mask, a poetry that tries to reveal, reveal the, uh, reveal the tearing of the mask. That is a, that is a metaphor Octavio Paz, uh, you know, the great uh, Mexican poet uses. Uh, um, that uh, poetry that looks face to face at the noonday and and tries to tear off the mask. So to to what what, what poets in a time like this perhaps have to do is to disentangle the effects of uh, power from uh, from articulation from 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 language and and in some way inscribe the suffering of the of the man in the period into their syntax into the structures of of uh, of their poetry speak about uh, solitude speak about uh, uh, fear that is uh, getting I mean, I mean becoming part of the human psyche uh, speak about uh, the, the the terrible truths uh, again uh, that is that is bethold brett uh, what is that he who loves has not yet heard the terrible tidings. That, you know, his poem uh, to the posterity begins with these lines. He who loves has not yet heard the terrible tidings. So uh, the people who love have not heard about actually what is happening and uh, the terrible events that are happening all, ar all around them. So and so it is in this context that in this context where expressing the inexpressible became the challenge of poetry making the invisible visible became the challenge of poetry it is um, uh, 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 that uh, 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 dalit poets um, you know minority poets various kinds of poets begin to begin to write um, um, so because the the primary function of poetry or perhaps of any art is to is to name the nameless and make uh, make the invisible visible what has been either what is invisible or what has been deliberately made invisible to make uh, to, br to bring them to the for uh, to the to the foreground and uh, foreground them and show them to uh, the readers uh, uh, i mean uh, those who those who follow poetry follow art that becomes a function a major function of art in a time like this i mean it is not it is not by reproducing established values and tr and given truths that poetry does its function but often by contesting uh, the created truths or what uh, Foucault would call the truth effect because the truth, I mean, you know, um, you know, I'm not, well, I'm not going into that. You know, <laughs> you know Nietzsche's, uh, Nietzsche's famous saying about the truth, you know, uh, uh, the kind of a procession. Uh, and and uh, Foucault also builds upon Nietzsche and uh, speaks about uh, uh, the truth effects. Because truth, truth is not something available readily, but uh, truth, uh, often the truth which appears in the form of uh, Again, I, I go back to um, Antonio Gramsci, the use of the word common sense, which you today see as common sense is often a kind of manufactured truth that has been imposed upon you by the machinery of governance or the, the, the power. The power structures are always meant to manufacture truths. Uh, they, and, and they manufacture truths, they, they, uh, they uh, propagate those so-called truths through the media, through the, I mean, through, through rhetoric to through weekly speeches or monthly speeches or whatever so so you have so so you have you, you have these uh, truths which are being uh, being manufactured and then propagated propagated uh, uh, directly by word of mouth or through the various kinds of uh, media which are very easy to purchase as we as we have been seeing and so um, uh, so the, so the, so truth uh, so this is what uh, Foucault called the truth effect I mean, it may not be actual truth but it has the uh, it is a kind of effect it looks like truth and it is necessary for the real truth seeker to fight these uh, uh, truth effects though these uh, manuf uh, truths manufactured by power and and the, and the poet's function the artist's function then becomes to speak truth to power i mean to to, to use a cliche but, but which is also an extremely meaningful expression uh, speaking truth to power becomes one of the essential functions of human beings uh, uh, all human beings and particularly of artists who are supposed to uh, to 
speak truth and to and to tell people whatever is happening i mean what what is happening to them and what is happening to the society around them and what is happening to their psyche what is happening to uh, the uh, the whole earth on which they are living so uh, all these uh, things are connected you know the ecological issues women's issues even though we divide them very easily but these issues are all linked together because it is all about the future of the human species uh, and uh, because we are all con the ultimate concern is the future of the humans if we are going to uh, be divided if you are going to create wars create machinery destroy environment destroy nature well all these and and then in the name of uh, if you dominate other people in the name of gender in the name of class in the name of caste uh, so that the uh, then all the, these are not to me at least i don't think they are unrelated question they are deeply related questions and you cannot shy away from one and then uphold only the other okay you can uphold one course because you may be committed to that course but uh, don't forget that there are other courses which are equally important and which are even if you don't know that connected with your course and this is what sometimes happens to well some of the identity movements and all that sometimes they forget that there are other issues which are equally important uh, not that the issue they raise is unimportant but there are equally important issues and ultimately all of us are striving towards or those who have a conscience are striving towards creating a more humane and egalitarian kind of society and if you lose sight of that you call it utopia but if you don't have a utopia what's the point of living so uh, I, I, we are all trying to create that kind of a, uh, of, of a utopia a, a, a new world an egalitarian uh, world a world of justice a world of, uh, where human beings are free and and that is how all the different kinds of struggle ultimately get connected somewhere so you have you cannot lose sight of that space where all the, the space of what i call convergence just because you believe in some kind of a divergence there is a kind of convergence and i think it is ultimately necessary for us to uh, keep a vision of that space where all the struggles come together and all the struggles uh, all, all those who struggle dream together and they share a common dream of another another world another mankind another another kind of society another kind of community another uh, 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 idea of justice and freedom and of uh, of equality <clears throat> and and so you find uh, for, uh, at least from the i don't know how much time i'm doing i mean i mean well um i'm sorry i'm trying your patience um so since the 70s uh, what has been happening i mean i'll i'll, I'll try to make it brief um, there is one there is a rise of uh, new movements actual mo social movements i mean like the dalit panther movement and all that which created a major poet like nandev dasal and then there are adivasis rising up women's movements civil rights organizations environmental and green movements coming up and new gandhian movements like uh, like what uh, jp uh, try to do uh, a kind of um, uh, the, the, so there were the, and there were nationwide uh, stri strikes by port workers and rail workers you know in i am speaking of the 70s the kind of atmosphere that created this new kind of poetry and there were various kinds of people's democratic movements and news about a kind of new subaltern awakening a, an awakening from 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 underground so there was a new awakening happening in the in the uh, in the in the 70s and then another context of this new literature is uh, emergency uh, which revealed a chink in the armor of democracy i mean to be i mean to briefly put it i mean we 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 believed that our democracy was solid and strong and rooted and all that and nobody can challenge us and it is then suddenly with a simple declaration suddenly you find the complete <laughs> democracy being uh, uh, i mean uh, demolished being uh, subverted so it revealed a chink in democracy's armor and it exposed the abusive potential of the constitution now i'm not blaming the constitution itself but the, but it uh, it was not unconstitutional because there was a provision for such a state in the constitution only that that provision was being abused it was being it was being misused and so uh, so as, uh, uh, it was being misused through uh, what uh, uh, agamben giorgio agamben would call a state of exception a state of exception i mean uh, kind of uh, exception becomes the rule and that that is exactly what happened during the during the emergency and and there was also a weaken a gradual weaken of federalism our federal structure ultimately our constitution is federal but uh, and even now we uh, we we, um, we speak in the name of uh, federalism but you find that 
very often in real politic federalism gets uh, marginalized and we get over centralized in many ways and um, um, and then there was the thirdly there was this growth or fourthly there was the growth of uh, corporatism and the corruption that always accompanies the growth of uh, uh, corporatism and then fifthly there was the globalization which means uh, ultimately a kind of a mono acculturation a homogenization of cultures uh, and also a, a kind of um, uh, epistemic uh, uh, and linguistic violence uh, because uh, the the, epi the po people's epistemologies are getting marginalized increasingly and there is a linguistic violence as uh, one language or a few languages claim uh, the whole linguistic space. It is true I am speaking, I am also sharing, uh, sharing my ideas in English, but, uh, but, but, uh, but of course English can be used also against, against English as, or against uh, as, <laughs> as, as Gandhi did or Nehru did and many of the freedom, the pioneers of the freedom struggle did, you know, they, they could, they, they showed that with the same language you could perhaps kill the people who were propagating that. So, uh, so, there, so there is a kind of linguistic linguistic violence, we are turning us into monolinguals. And, 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 and there is a problem with, I have a major problem with monolinguals, whatever language it is, you know. Uh, because I have always found from my own experience and the experience of other people that uh, unless you have at least a second second language, if not a third, fourth and fifth language, etc., uh, you, you somehow the horizon of your experience becomes, it shrinks, it becomes, it becomes extremely small. It is always necessary, okay, there are people who write in English, but I would, uh, but I know that the best of them again are informed by another language. There is another language. Look at Arun Kolarkar, who, whom I consider the best poet who has ever appeared in Indian English uh, poetry. So look at Kolarkar, so he, he has this, he, he because uh, he is informed by uh, you know Marathi, the rhythms and the and the and uh, of, the, of the speech and and Dilip Chitre, you could you could take many other names of uh, uh, A.K. Ramanujan, uh, um, take take uh, names of uh, many of those pioneers who were writing in English very often. Of course, Ramanujan also wrote in Canada. Some of them wrote also in different languages, like Kamaladas did or Ramanujan did or Parsarathy did. So there are many people who write in two languages or or some novelists uh, do. Uh, so uh, so to be informed by another, because every language. Uh, um, somehow gives you, uh, somehow expands the kind of horizon of your experience and understanding. Because as I said, language is a way of looking at reality. And if you know so many languages, it means uh, you have so many ways of looking at reality, uh, which uh, uh, which always uh, you know, gives you a kind of option. You can look at reality like this or like this, and you know the multiple possibilities of articulating reality. I mean, to, to make it again brief. So you have multiple possibilities of articulating reality when you have uh, uh, command on more than one language and if you have command on many languages because actually our tradition is a kind of mul multilingual tradition if you because you do, you do not even know the language in which Kabir or Meera wrote because uh, Gujaratis will say it was Gujarati and the, you know and uh, uh, Hindi uh, spokesman will say she was a Hindi poet and this is true about Kabir also uh, because they wrote in many la many many uh, dialects uh, which are uh, well I am not going into that argument <laughs> because you remember that uh, uh, there is this famous saying that a dialect becomes a language when it has a, uh, when it has an army and a political party. <laughs> so so, uh, so you, you find Hojpuri is spoken by a lot of people but they do not have a, a state but Bodos have a state because they decided to battle, to, to fight. It is simple. I mean uh, these differences between dialect and a language, well that is a very tricky kind of question and any time a dialect may become a language or a language uh, may be reduced to a dialect because uh, Oriya I, I remember Oriya and Asamiya were considered the dialects of Bengali earlier. You know, now I don't think uh, anyone will dare say that. But there was a time when um, people, be, be, at least the Bengalis, uh, uh, Bengali Bhadralog be, believed that Oriyas and uh, Asamiyas, uh, Asamis people were just speaking one of the dialects of uh, Bengali. So I am not going into that. But what I mean is that uh, there is uh, the, what what is happening under globalization is the death. Of, death. Of, that is why how I. Um, well, I uh, came here. So there, there, so there is this uh, destruction of languages. There is this attempt to turn the whole world monolingual. English speaking people across across the globe, everybody speaks only English uniform, they, they wear the same kind of dress, they wear the same kind of cap and they, you know they march ahead. They like, uh, yeah, so, so that kind of a vision, it's a terrible nightmare 
of a, of a world where everybody thinks alike, everybody acts alike, everybody speaks the same language. So it is. It, uh, so so what ultimately globalization is trying to do is to impose this kind of a. Un I am speaking only of the cultural. I am not going into the economics of globalization, which is which is another nightmare. But then, uh, <laughs> yeah. so, because this is enough. This nightmare is enough for me. <laughs> and then, and also the digitization of reality. Reality gets uh, digitized. And what happens then? Whatever cannot be digitized becomes very unimportant and left out of reality. If you cannot digitize something, uh, uh, you know, I mean, uh, then that part of reality becomes uh, completely unimportant. And what is it? And so, what cannot be counted? What cannot be weighed? What cannot be measured? All these are out of reality. And what is it that cannot be counted, that cannot be measured? Not only Brahma, but also poetry. <laughs> poetry. <laughs> because that, you know, you know, that, you know, you know the definition of Brahma in in Kano Banishat, Nadatra Chakshur Gachadi, Vagachadi, Namana, Navitmo, Navijani Mo, Yathaita, then Shishyat. Well, <laughs> well, it means Nadatra Chakshur Gachadi, eyes do not go there. The word does not uh, go there. Navitmo, uh, you cannot learn it. Navijani mo, you cannot teach it as it is to the disciples. As it is, you cannot teach it to the disciples. So it is something, in short, something that cannot be counted, that cannot be measured, that cannot be understood, that cannot be named. But art also is, uh, uh, that may be why it was called Brahma, Swara, Sahodaram, Sahodaram and all that. So art also is something which is difficult to count and measure and weigh and all that. Even though we constantly keep doing that, putting value to, you know, uh, to, to poetry, and to art, uh, you know, and all that. Because we are living in a world of auction where everybody is saying, come and auction me. And so, uh, uh, so, um, so rea reality that cannot be weighed and measured gets uh, left out in a, in a digitized world where that reality, which is our experience, our agony, our pleasure, uh, all these uh, are the, the, the intimate experiences of human beings, love, Again, cannot be counted or measured or you know or weighed. So all these uh, wa wa things that make us hu actual human beings. So these things get left out of uh, the idea of reality. And also there is a continuous attempt to destroy the uh, uh, various kinds of traditional worldviews and cosmologies. And and, and there is an, and on the whole there is an extension of colonial paradigms of uh, Western universalism of technofascism of uh, creating new kinds of uh, hierarchies uh, and so that's why Baudrillard, the, the French thing are called globalization, the greatest violence of our time, the greatest violence of our time, a violence which is not often seen, which may not uh, shed blood, but which, uh, which is there um, uh, like, like, a, like a steamroller, you know, turning us all into commodities, into standardized beings which, who speak one language, who think uh, uh, in one way and, uh, uh, and, and turn us all into uh, people in uniform. And then uh, sixthly, there is the growth of divisive communalism, which is the very opposite of spirituality. I consider I consider these complete opposites: uh, communalism and, and and spiritual. At least what I understand by spirituality, and 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 so this creates what. Uh, well, in the morning also I spoke about it. What um, uh, Umberto Eco uh, calls. Uh, or fascism or the universal fascism uh, which uh, I mean he has a famous uh, a, a little book uh, which all of you I think uh, I would recommend uh, if you haven't read already five moral pieces where he has a wonderful essay on what is a, what is the essential fascism or I mean it, it is not Nazism it is not I mean it is not a particular it, it doesn't have a particular name but th there are certain characters which keep appearing in 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 politics in in society from time to time and he calls it that uh, that universal or fundamental fascism which I will not uh, dwell on that long I would just define uh, the way in which uh, eco defines uh, uh, fascism uh, this kind of fascism uh, one is the uncritical, uncritical worship of tradition. The world is seen as something revealed and not a subject of exploration. A rejection of modernism, the invocation of non-existing, a non-existing golden age in the past, a suspicion of culture and of intellectuals, 
the fear of diversity and difference, an exclusive, not an inclusive definition of the nation, leading to jingoism and xenophobia, and, and creating an other or others as a sole reason for the failures of the nation. Now, creating an other, making the Muslim, making the Christian, making the Parsi, the other. Who is responsible for everything that has gone wrong uh, in, in the country? Creating xenophobia, creating uh, a whole ideology of, uh, of uh, hatred. And, and, and then seeing conspiracy in all protests, uh, our protest was called manufactured revolt by a great minister, uh, you know, and then treating the opposition as enemy, Racial ego, opposition and enemy, these are two different things, you know, opposing, intellectually opposing something, opposing an idea. That does not mean he or she is your enemy, because they, he or she has a different opinion. So, but seeing the opposition as the enemy is again a, a sign of a fascist uh, state, of, uh, state of mind. And, and then uh, racial egoism, linguistic chauvinism, authoritarianism, what I would call a muscular majoritarianism, because uh, because the function of democracy is not to uh, not to be with the majority, but to protect the minority. And to, in order to see whether democracy is functioning, you should look at the minorities and not the majority. You should look at the Muslims. You should look at the Dalit. You should look at the Adivasi and see what is happening to them. And that is where democracy should actually function. And so there is this uh, 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 this kind of a, major, a muscular majoritarian, so showing that we are the majority. And so we will we will rule in the way we like, and the contempt for the weak, uh, and uh, uh, you know even Hitler used to say the people uh, um, um, the people are like uh, like a woman, um, so it, it is a double mistake. Uh, <laughs> so to first to first to imagine that the woman is weak, and then to compare uh, uh, people uh, with uh, with women who can uh, he thinks they can be easily subjected, which I hope is um, absolutely wrong. So, uh, so, so, so this, uh, and and so there is a kind of contempt for uh, the weak people, and a, and a compromise, and uh, um, a compromise is always seen as a kind of as a sign of weakness. So you should be strong, and you should be muscular, and 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 the worship of masculinity, what is what is often a constructed masculinity, uh, uh, and and the, and the worship of death also. Uh, you know, Vivala Murte, that was uh, the, the 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 slogan of the uh, in Spain. Uh, so so the, 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 the argument is, if I am ready to die, I have also the right to kill. That is how that logic works. So, uh, and so they worship, they, they, they worship de death, like the IS does or like many other organizations in India uh, um, also do. So, and, and the hate, and, and what uh, uh, Rak Ranse calls the hatred of democracy. Actually, I mean, they may, of course, uh, when you enter the parliament, you may touch the floor, but then, uh, but, but, you, but, but, you, but you actually, actually hate, actually hate democracy. Why all these people are sitting here in this parliament? Why are, they, why, you know, because they should all listen to me, and I am enough to rule the country, and why should there be ministers, why should there be parliamentarians, why should there be, I don't know, opposition to, and so, so that, so that is what, uh, that is what the person thinks when he's touching the floor of the, uh, the, the steps of the parliament. He thinks that uh, I am entering a space where things seem to be so uncertain and where my my uh, governance might uh, any moment be questioned, and 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 this so this kind of this is what you call the hatred of democracy because uh, they see people as a kind of monolith. They will say we are the people, and when they say this is my voice is the people's voice, that's what Hitler also said, and and a blind faith in propaganda in moral righteousness and the consequent policing of uh, humanity and again what uh, again Nico himself uses the word Huxley also I think somewhere uses the word the new speak uh, the new by the new speak they mean seeing everything as black and white there are no gray regions either you are my friend or you are my enemy because suppose you have a because we all have critical relationships with many ideas and many things but that there is no space for that it is either black or white. That is a typical fascist way of uh, looking at things and thinking. And uh, so, so seeing everything as black and white and a suspicion of every, uh, that's why the, the, that means su suspecting everything that is subtle. 
everything that is a gray region so they they think there is a danger in that if there is somebody is speaking subtly in a very nuanced way there is a, so you have to say well i am with you uh, uh, or i am with uh, I, I, I am not with you but uh, b- between that they cannot imagine a third position a nuanced and subtle position between that which can be a, a meaningful critical relationship that most of us have uh, with human beings and with uh, with ideas and uh, along with that there is a uh, you know the, the and and uh, seventhly actually that the, i was telling uh, speaking of the context of the 70s the growth of culture industry that trivializes uh, i'm using adorno's word uh, culture industry that trivializes and commodifies all art trivializing art commercializing art that is what uh, uh, i don't know would call uh, the culture industry and and also something else happened during those times the discovery of a parallel tradition in modernism mainly in the 70s a lot of these uh, poets got uh, translated into many of the indian languages like brett or neruda or orden or shemus heni or yanis sotsos um, um, uh, sengor uh, sesayer um, simborka um, spinu herbert uh, and many of the latin american and african poets many of them got translated into uh, some, at least some of the major indian languages during that period of time. so there was a discovery of another tradition within modernism which was a kind of parallel tradition where uh, the uh, there was a kind of uh, what I, i would simply call an egalitarian orientation there was the dream of another society in many of these poets and that tradition within modernism which was not very visible in the 60s may was made visible in the 70s through the availability of texts and also through translations and all that and so there were a lot of avant-garde movements which came up as a kind of response wants to uh, these and rea- and and it also sometimes reacted against the individualism of some of the early modernists and but that uh, aesthetic break that modernism brought about i think was Uh, I, i think was very extremely uh, extremely important because without that perhaps this movement would not have been possible because the, the possibility of new language the possibility of uh, you know even 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 namdev tasar would not have been possible had there not been say the whole tradition uh, right from martekar and rege and to you know so many uh, so many of the poets who wrote before him uh, made possible by by the kind of break that Uh, so now you could challenge because already the ground was set and you could use these in a very different way and create a new kind of uh, new kind of po- uh, new kind of poetry um so there was so there was a need to take a stand against the uh, status quo and at the same time a blind faith in a single ideology was becoming more and more impossible and and difficult uh, uh, because unlike some of the early progressives that was also becoming difficult because so many revolutions are failed and you could no more continue with that facile optimism that things are acche um, dinare so uh, i mean good, <laughs> good days are coming you could no more you could no more believe in that because uh, uh, everybody had said good days were coming and good days ne- did not sadly come even after the revolutions and so it was becoming very difficult to um, uh, to have that kind of a very superficial um, uh, optimism uh, so that pro- so there was a failure of revolutions then prescriptions and proscriptions and there were well i am not well that that will lead me to a whole uh, you know post structuralist area of uh, uh, theory i mean there were new theories of reading coming up I mean, you could read the same text in different fashions uh, and i need not give you examples you read uh, you read gandhi's understanding of the gita and golwalkar's understanding of the gita or you re- you look at the uh, many ramayanas we have and uh, look at a woman reading ramayana from sita's point of view or look at uh, a dalit reading mahabharata from ekalavya's point of view so there are many the possibility of many readings and the understanding that language and uh, poetry is ultimately polyphonic that is having many voices within and people choose their own the voices that they want to hear or the voices that they they think uh, are there in 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 the poem and so uh things became in a, came to be in a flux theoretically also there was no single and permanent meaning meanings could change and uh, from uh, time to time the same text may be read in different ways read by reading i mean not only reading it may be staging like like in like in theater uh, because you know you could play with uh, hamlet and othello like uh, it was done in some of the uh, hindi films recently so you could you could turn these things and use them in different ways re- read different meanings into the same into the same text if at all there is the same text well i will not go 
going to all those uh, um, uh, right from Roland Bart to Foucault. Uh, there have been a lot of uh, new uh, new ways of understanding uh, literature, understanding the working of, uh, of of language. There can be a contradiction between the intention of the author and the and uh, um, there can be a uh, um, between the revolutionary intention and the reactionary realization in the in the same kind of text about which even 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 Lenin has spoken about that. You know, there was a major argument between uh, Lenin and Plihanov. Plihanov said uh, Tolstoy is a reactionary author because he's a Catholic, he was born in a rich, uh, he was an aristocrat, uh, but Lenin called him the mirror of the Russian Revolution. So even in those days, uh, there was this, uh, it, it, it was not properly theorized, but there was this understanding that the same text or the same uh, work could be understood in different ways and you could produce different texts out of the same, same work. But language, but at the same time, language is social. It has, uh, it, um, you cannot escape that the, 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 the social within language because every word has its associations and mythological fossils and archetypal incrustations and so all writing cannot but but be social ultimately, even if it looks very solitary, very different, because every word comes with a lot of memories and associations and all that. What you call the uh, the, the aura of the of the word. The, every word comes with an aura of uh, micro memories and associations. And because of that, you cannot escape tradition. You cannot escape uh, uh, society ultimately. And and so uh, uh, um, you you will find that. Uh, there were, people found, uh, poets found there was a new reality and the new reality needed a new kind of language, language being a way of, uh, of looking at reality. And, and they also felt the old kind of progressive poetry is in inadequate to express uh, uh, our times. And it is from this background, I will not uh, dwell long on that because I, I, I recently held an uh, organized a seminar in our Indian Institute of Advanced Studies about poetry as counterculture. So if you look at uh, if you look at uh, the tradition of Indian poetry, you will find that uh, there there is a major counter by countercultural I mean uh, against the hegemonic culture against the against the uh, um, the the, under, uh, the understanding of culture in a particular time. Our poets have always responded to that. Folk poets, tribal poets, Bhakti poets, Sufi poets, if you read them closely, you will find most of them have uh, gone against the grain. They have spoken against the, un the existing understanding, the status quo -ist understanding of religion, or even of religion, of God, of various kinds of things uh, propagated by a, na a narrow understanding of uh, the, the spiritual. So, so uh, and, and then you find, and so that tradition continued during the you know, freedom struggle and later during the early progressive period and and in modernism and in what happened after modernism so you you find that the real tradition of indian poetry is perhaps a tradition of interrogation it's not a tradition of accusations not a tradition of saying yes to everything but saying no kabir said no and and so did tukaram so did you know all the all the major you know poets uh, uh, right from uh, the early uh, uh, tribal and folk poets who challenged the authority of of of, the, of their masters and landlords up to uh, uh, the Dalit poets or the Adivasi poets uh, um, or the um, or the um, um, homoerotic uh, poets of our time uh, or the or the poets who advocate a new kind of spirituality the green poetry uh, uh, or, or who or the or the poets who advocate a kind of secular spirituality whose roots lie perhaps uh, in in bhakti um, Dilip Chitra and Kolatkar have spoken a lot about uh, that and because they were also translators of bhakti poetry and the uh, and, and, and so speaking against the displacement, against the market, against war, and our speaking, uh, celebrating regional cultures, uh, which was, uh, uh, you know, the basis of the Deshivad or, or nativism, poetry that redefines love in our times in new ways. And so, so I, because I, I have no time to go into uh, the aesthetics of each of these movements, because each of these movements has also produced an, an uh, implied aesthetics, because the challenging the existing aesthetics. Like uh, like Dalit poetry, for, because Dalit poetry is against many things, many injunctions in the early Sanskrit poetics. Because according to the early Sanskrit poetics, you know, you cannot, I mean, mostly you cannot use uh, words which are gramya, rural, 
then uh, ashleel uh, which is uh, which are supposed to be obscene by the existing standards of uh, uh, standards of uh, social morality and so you cannot you, uh, use uh, you uh, you, uh, you uh, so there are there are very uh, very uh, or you you cannot use words which are anuchit which is not uh, which is not proper so but you find a lot uh, dalit poets using exactly those words which are supposed to be uh, dasal for example is supposed to be uh, you know in gandhubha grija and all that he uses a lot of uh, words which are supposed to be obscene uh, you and they use constantly use words which are the rural basically rustic basically rural so this is how they create a new aesthetics of language a new understanding of language and also so i am not looking at them purely as a social uh, e events but they were also linguistic events because they bring in words and uh, expressions from the marginalized that is how they become dalit poets not by being born a dalit but because they bring in they enrich the language by bringing in new registers of poetry new registers of language uh, you uh, words uh, which were expression which were never used in poetry before them because they 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 pick up their words from like uh, earlier it was said from the rubbish dump so they they pick their pick up their words from the from the colonies in which they live from the from the kinds of work that they do the work jargon the, the that uh, that all so enriches their poetry so they choose words from the slum words which were uh, out of the uh, out of the range of uh, the divine poetry and they create a, a human poetry which uh, which is what what need to call the impure poetry i'm bringing in everything bringing in all kinds of things it's all right you are a, you are a great progressive writer but we would like to embrace our women and not machines not <laughs> not uh, tractors and you know so 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 that is also a rebellion that's i mean speaking of love in a time when love is considered a treason how do i close okay <laughs> Uh, because I, I also wanted to say what we have to resist again i'll make i'll just say one sentence it is violence ultimately if the if, if, when you speak of resistance you naturally ask what is it that we are resisting it is violence violence in the form of patriarchy in the form of communalism in the form of market and globalization in the form of caste certain particular versions of nationalism authoritarian forms of hierarchy inhuman technology corporate capitalism and its anti-human ideas of development all these come under what i call violence in large violence is not just killing somebody but these are different kinds of violence that we face today and it is necessary to fight every form of violence and to be and, and to to up turn the virgin soil and free language from uh, associations with power and reconnect with other human beings and also with nature which is one, again one of the base ra radical functions of poetry today to reconnect with nature uh, uh, from which we have alienated ourselves and redefine the borders between the self and the other between self and nature interrogate anthropocentrism i mean everything is uh, man centered that that kind of uh, uh, understanding and also and the human hubris the the, the, the pride that ultimate the ultimate pride of man, human being is that i am a human being i am i am about animals and above plants and all that and address the solitary and alienated and the sad human being put love and non violence at the core of poetry and so uh, so so whatever the path you pursue because often students of world poetry have divided it into uh, revolutionary poetry and magical poetry but i find that in the best of the poets uh, these are not uh, separate they 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 exist together uh, if you take uh, a poet like yanis rousos uh, whom i respect a lot the great great greek poet uh, or or uh, simborska so humane uh, so take any of the cesar vallejo i mean you vasco popa you could you could name many poets you, in in the best of poets at least for who are the best of poets to me they combine these uh, spirit there is a, there is an interrogation in um, sometimes very subtle and nuanced but there is an interrogation and also there is a, a magical element to that because poetry basically has that kind of a, of a of a magic so poetry needs to i i, because I wanted to say something about a recent as of uh, zisek i am not going into that i will just conclude saying poetry today needs to retrieve its deep human voice and be as beautiful and transparent like a pinch of salt once raised against a monstrous uh, empire and i end with a quote from pass we must find the lost word dream inwardly and outwardly decipher the night's tattooing look face to face at the noon day and tear off the mask i am history a memory 
reinventing itself i am never alone i move in the dark i plant signs as i genius i am history a memory reinventing itself i am never alone i move in the dark i plant signs so that is one way in which i would like to <laughs> i have many ways of concluding this lecture but this is one way in which i would conclude the lecture i don't know whether i have time for a poem or something but i think it is too much <laughs> no no uh, no i want to read two three poems more but uh, i don't think i'll do that but uh, <clears throat> but i would like to if you permit me um, I'll read two short poems anyway because I think without that I don't feel it is complete. I mean, one one was written for Perumal Murugan when he was silenced, uh, you know, by uh, by some communal people. Uh, fortunately, the court has gone against it, uh, but that doesn't mean that the poem is uh, um, uh, obsolete. I wrote it when Perumal Murugan decided to ask uh, apologize. Uh, it's called pardon. Pardon me for what I have written, for what I could not write. what i am likely to write and what i may never write pardon me for the trees flowering for the flowers fruiting for having hoarded so much of gold and water and spring inside the earth pardon me for the waning moon for the setting sun the movement of the living the stillness of the non living pardon me for filling earth with so much of color blood with so much red leaf with forest rain with sky sand with star and ink with dreams pardon me for filling words with so much meaning dates with so much history for having hidden today inside yesterday and tomorrow inside today for creating the creator who fills gestures with dance and nature with symbols pardon for the earthquake and the tempest the wild fire and the raging sea earth is a damaged machine i am not the one to repair it i am the king without a country i i i play on the words perumal murugan perumal is em, you know emperor and murugan is uh, you know the, the the god with the with the, with the trident I, i am not the one to repair it i am the king without a country the god without a weapon നാടില്ലാത്ത പെരുമാൾ വേലില്ലാത്ത മുരുകൻ ദാറ്റ് ഹൗ ഇറ്റ് ഇസ് ഇൻ മലയാളം ഐ ആം ദ കിങ് വിത്തൗട്ട് എ കൺട്രി ദ ഗോ ദ ഗോഡ് വിത്തൗട്ട് എ വെപ്പൺ ലൈഫ് വിത്തൗട്ട് എ ടങ് ഇൻവെൻറ്റ് എ ഗോഡ് ദാറ്റ് ഡസൻറ്റ് ആസ്ക് ഫോർ യുവർ ഹെഡ് ഇൻവെൻറ്റ് ദ ഫിയർലെസ് മാൻ ഇൻവെൻറ്റ് ലാംഗ്വേജ് ആൽഫബെറ്റ് താങ്ക് യു i am totally aware that uh, pune ka sir more time conscious than mumbai <laughs> the mumbai is unnecessarily famous for it so i will not take much of your time after such a profound and sweeping speech i don't think what gajanan expected me to do to sum up as a chairperson i will not sum up this can't be summed up everybody has to sum up in their own mind talking of mind i will just do my man ki baat <laughs> if you if you he was talking of translation and language if you translate what is man ki baat it means mein kampf <laughs> if <laughs> no that's because we are discussing translation in different languages so it is not necessary to no german or hindi to understand mein kampf i will just illustrate this point in perhaps 3 minutes is that we are used in india and actually globally now but in india surely that it was maun ki baat which was more powerful than man ki baat gandhi ji practiced maun ki baat he used to just keep silent keep quiet and that used to threaten the british empire his hunger strike not eating and not speaking could threaten british empire and today 
that man is reduced only as a brand ambassador for Clean Up India. It is just an advertisement. He has become a model. What uh, amazes me, as Mr. Sachidan was saying, is how artists can actually look into the things which many people don't. Charlie Chaplin made his film The Great Dictator in 1940, 1940, when actually Hitler was uni uh, winning Europe. He was actually winning in Europe. He was not challenged yet at Stalingrad in 1941, which began his defeat. <coughs> and yet, Charlie Chaplin made a film which is so critical. Not only critical, it uses every single instrument in literary form, sarcasm, even aesthetics. At the end when Hitler, that is Charlie Chaplin, is speaking in The Great Dictator, the Jew girl or that young poor girl, what she hears is the language of compassion from Hitler in that film, if you remember. So how she understood the message of Ache Din, as Hitler thought would come. And that was how Charlie Chaplin saw the future coming and definitely exactly five years later Hitler had to kill himself after devastating Germany by killing about 80 lakh people, devastating Soviet Union by killing about 3 crore people. Another film of his modern times was made in 1936 when television was not invented, it was just being experimented. And time and motion study that is shown in that Charlie Chaplin's film where the manager of the factory and the owner says workers spend too much time in lunch time and going to toilets and in those toilets in 1936 of Charlie Chaplin's film there is a camera watching the workers going to toilet and then there is a machine which feeds him even as he is working on his conveyor belt. I think that was the futuristic notion of art. Finally, as he very correctly says, in capitalism, everything is commodified. For instance, in the 1960s, even in the United States, to wear jeans was a rebellion. Today, jeans are more expensive than normal pants, and jeans have such huge global companies, corporate companies, they market jeans. When Beatles began, they actually used to have a hat in the hand to collect money. Later on, Beatles became so famous and so marketed that they collected literally billions of pounds and dollars and Beatles got marketed. The Beatles revolution, the countercultural revolution with Bob Dylan also became a commodity product. So everything that was considered in 1960s and 70s as rebellion, capitalism appropriated it and converted that into commodity in front of us. At the beginning of Cultural Revolution in 1966, exactly 50 years ago, I was a flag bearer of Cultural Revolution. I thought, yes, just by revolution, things will not be streamlined. Even after revolution, new bourgeoisie, new bureaucratic bourgeoisie, new communist party bourgeoisie has emerged, it must be fought and the idea of cultural revolution is great. So I accepted it idea reading Joan Robinson. Soon we realized, I mean not that time, later we realized that cultural revolution became its own enemy within just four years and Mao Zedong could not understand what is happening, finally had to withdraw but by that time at least a few million people were dead. So even cultural revolution, which was trying to re-stabilize the revolutionary values, had to surrender to the forces of market or forces of history. I think we are passing through the most dangerous times in India, more dangerous than we thought emergency was. Because emergency, as he said, was officially declared according to constitution by abusing constitution. Today, emergency is not declared and we are living through very similar, very, very similar experiences when now media does not require to be bought. Media is just told what to do. We are living in the era of advent of Arnab Goswami. 
we are living in the era of social media we are living in the era of trolling this social media let me tell you is far more destructive than nuclear weapons because this operates on minds and just that the capitalism is using social media so is iss using social media so we are perhaps heading for a catastrophic end which some artists and some scientists have seen including stephen hawking who says time has come for humanity to migrate to other planets to save itself and stephen and uh, martin rees says this is our final hour just final hour our final hour that is our final century and this century will not end normally it will end in catastrophe that looks like apocalyptic picture but if apocalypse is likely to be real i think we have to be close to reality because reality is happening just around us thank you very much The show is over.